Okay. Hey folks, welcome. I'm Ash. I work at Firestorm Books and Coffee, and I'm here to kick us to kick off today's event featuring Gabriel Kuhn and Neil Asambi as they plan to discuss Gabriel's latest book, Liberating Sami, and the Sami's ongoing fight for justice and self-determination in Europe's far north. This event is organized in collaboration with our friends at PM Press for Radical May, a month-long international series of events organized by the Radical Publishers Alliance that seeks to challenge broken social and economic systems and organize for a better, more radical future. We'll be hosting another event for Radical May titled Anarchism and the Modern State on Tuesday, May 18th to mark the publication of The Operating System, an accessible new interrogation of state governance by author Eric Larson. So if you are excited about today's event, you'll definitely want to check that one out too. Um, before we begin today, for an event that centers Indigenous resistance, I want to take a moment to acknowledge the political context of the land we are on, and that for those of us in the United States, wherever we are viewing from, we are on Indigenous land. For our context at Firestorm, we operate on occupied Cherokee territory in Southern Appalachia and so-called Asheville, North Carolina. As it is our responsibility to critically engage with the reality of this colonial legacy, today's event will grapple with some of the present day manifestations and ongoing impact of conquest and colonization. For folks attending an event with us for the first time, Firestorm is a 13 year old collectively owned radical bookstore and community event space with a focus on queer, feminist and anarchist thought and culture. We host a wide range of events, workshops and film screenings, as well as meetings for various grassroots community organizations. While our doors have been closed to the public since March of 2020 due to the global pandemic, we did just announce our plans to reopen for browsing at the end of the month, which is very exciting after a difficult 14 months of closure. So if you are local or you want to take a trip to come check us out, we hope to see you soon. Um, in the meantime, we continue to sell books online through our website and are shipping books all over the country. If you're interested, our full catalog can be viewed on the website including today's featured book. Um, so please do make sure to check us out and I'll drop links to everything I just mentioned um, in the chat and in the comments. So as I said earlier, today's conversation features author Gabriel Kuhn in conversation with longtime Sami activist, Nilas Sambi. Nilas is just one of many Sami activists to show up in Gabriel's latest book, Liberating Sami, which includes in-depth interviews with Sami artists, activists, and scholars. Um, today, Gabriel will start us off by telling us a bit more about the book, and then we'll move into a conversation with Nilas. Um, just one note for those attending on Zoom, if you have questions during the conversation, please feel free to submit them through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen. Uh, once Gabriel and Nilas finish up, they will open up for questions from the audience, but please feel free to submit your questions as they come up throughout the conversation, as our speakers may choose to work them organically into the conversation rather than wait till the end. Great. Um, so to introduce today's speakers, Gabriel Kuhn is a writer based in Sweden and has worked for numerous radical publishers and journals as a writer, translator, and editor, where his main interests have been reflected throughout his work. Sports, straight edge culture, protest movements, social justice, and international solidarity. He runs the, the blog Left23, which I will link to in the chat as well. 
Nila Sambi has worked as a reindeer herder, sailor, mechanic, photographer, and journalist. He's a longtime Sami activist who spent a number of years on Turtle Island, sheltered by First, First Nations, protecting him from the reach of the Norwegian judicial system. Gabriel, Nilas, thank you so much for being here today. And Gabriel, I will hand it over to you. Um, thanks so much for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. As um, most people who are watching this will appreciate, um, unless you work in television, it's uh, fairly awkward to speak to an audience that you cannot see while being aware that um, they can see you. Uh, on top of that, this is as unbelievable as it may sound about the third Zoom event that I am partaking in, in any capacity. So I'm far from an expert, but um, thanks to Nilas, the next 90 minutes will um, nonetheless be uh, interesting. And uh, I hope if you uh, notice that I am a bit lost at times that you can be generous. It's, uh, as I said, lack of experience. Now, Nilas is certainly the person you wanna hear from uh, tonight and we'll get there very soon. But since this has been announced as a book presentation, um, I will uh, say something about the book, uh, maybe take 10 minutes uh, just to uh, provide a little background uh, of why I did this book and, and, and how it is uh, structured. And then we'll basically move on to an interview with Nilas. And um, as Ash said, you are welcome to Submit questions at any time. I try to have my eye here on the on the Q and A uh, part, and uh, we'll try to either work in the questions, work them into the interview, or then add them on towards the end. And I hope that we can work in all of the questions. I have no idea how many we'll uh, receive, but I will do my best. Um, so about the book, I maybe start off with a question that. Um, always comes up whether people ask uh, that question um, are straightforward about asking it or not, but that is why someone like myself who grew up in the Austrian Alps is doing a book about the um, indigenous uh, people of Northern Europe. So a very short, the very short um, uh, story is that I've had a, a long-standing interest in indigenous peoples, with, which started with um, very romantic notions, uh, particularly of Native Americans when I was very young. It's a very common thing in the German-speaking world. Turned into more of a political interest than uh, during my politicization in the context of being interested in anti-colonial and anti-imperialist politics. And that interest was followed up by, by travels to what we know as North America, Australia, New Zealand, and other places uh, where uh, indigenous populations are involved in uh, resistance struggles. So naturally, when I came to Sweden in 2007, I was curious to learn more about uh, the situation in Sápmi and up, up uh, which is uh, the, the traditional uh, homeland of the Sami people. And up to that point, I think if you look at my work, that, that interest in indigenous struggles um, um, pops up here and there, but I never felt that it was my place to do a bigger project on that. And I certainly didn't think that when I first came to Sweden either. And then I guess during the years, different things happened. One was that I was surprised about the lack of, of interest in, in Stop me uh, among non Sami activists here um, in Sweden, which, um, as I said, it surprised me. I guess there was an element of irritation as well. And, and, and I think that played into eventually thinking that, well, if none of the, the, the activists from here is working on this, why shouldn't I try to make a, a contribution to spread more information about this internationally? 
Um, but more importantly, the more I learned about the history, the, 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 the more certain I became that these are stories uh, to be told, uh, both with respect to the generation that Nilas belongs to, which um, uh, started what's often referred to, uh, were involved in, in um, starting what's often referred to as the Sami civil rights movement in the late 1970s and 1980s, but also a younger generation of Sami artists, activists, categories that often, often overlap in Sami culture um, who are active uh, today. And then I just felt that I found myself in a, a position more or less uh, because of biographical coincidence where I was here in Sweden. And although I do not unfortunately speak Sami, I uh, know Swedish and Norwegian, which means that I am able to communicate with the vast majority of Sami people. I have access to the majority of Sami media. And at the same time, I had uh, I have a well-established uh, collaboration with PM Press who were interested in doing in such a book. And uh, since I felt that a book in English was uh, lacking, there are many very good books about the Sami in English, but a lot of them are, are fairly long. They're hard to find. They're uh, academic studies. And I felt there was no um, shorter, accessible, um, affordable, also, I guess, political uh, introduction to the history and, and culture and, and the, the politics of the Sami people. And so um, I decided to do the book. I still had to answer the question of how to do it. And um, essentially I chose a very uh, journalistic approach. So there is a longer introduction to the book. It's about a third, um, which is called A Short Political History of Sami, where I'm basically trying to, or tying together different um, historical, cultural, political um, facts to provide background for readers. And then the main part of the book is, as has been said in the introduction, it makes up two thirds of the book. And that is interviews with 12 Sami activists, um, artists, and scholars. There are illustrations in the book. Uh, there are some uh, shorter texts, uh, mainly by Sami authors that, um, uh, illustrate um, the interviews. And uh, Nilas is one of the people who um, volunteered to be interviewed for the book and who features in the book. Um, I was very honored that uh, he said yes, and I'm very honored that he's uh, with us today. And Nilas, my first question to you would um, refer to the basically the history, the culture and introduction to the, uh, to the Sami people, as I've often as a feedback to the book received, either um, uh, I've heard from people that they either knew nothing about the Sami people at all, or they knew that they existed, but they had very little knowledge. So if you just want to take the time and, and give a little introduction here, that would be great. I think you have to unmute your uh, microphone. Okay. Uh, I'm very honored to be here tonight. And uh, I very much thank Gabriel for writing this book. It's very important for the Sami people to that the, the world gets to, to know us because uh, Norway is always uh, trying to play the role of the savers of the world and the best boy in the class. And unfortunately, it isn't uh, like that. They're very tricky with their politic and, uh, and especially the politic uh, which is uh, hitting us, Sami. They uh, started uh, in the 80s with, uh, with zero rights and zero talk about the rights for the Sami people. The, the, some, the rights of the Sami people were totally missing. There was uh, 
there wasn't uh, an agenda of Sami rights at all in the in the Norwegian politic. So what we did was that we tried to we tried to do the different uh, so-called democratic ways to to get on the agenda, but uh, without any success. So we. We were some young people then. It's a long time ago. I was also young. So, so we started the hunger strike in Oslo. And uh, we had, uh, we had uh, not a wish, but uh, what, is the, the, what is the stronger than a wish? That uh, we uh, wanted to to do the hunger strike until the Norwegian government recognized the, the Sami rights to land and water. And they, uh, of course they didn't. They said that we cannot see any, any problems. We cannot, uh, as, uh, as talking like a blind people that we cannot see. And uh, they had uh, eyes, good eyes, and they even had and uh, glasses. So, so they did. So they did see, and they did know. But the result of that was that uh, after a week, they agreed that uh, okay, we can start a Sami Rights Commission. And. Uh, that the Sami Rights Commission was working in 18 years before they came out with anything. And of course, uh, 18 years is a very long time. Lots of people uh, are, are born in that time and people are also passed away in that time. And uh, finally, they, the, the big thing for us was then that uh, they anyway recognized that uh, there might be some Sami rights and they were working with, uh, with that. And uh, that, uh, for to make a long story short, that uh, they came up with the offer for the Sami people that uh, you guys will get a Sami parliament, which is called Sami Dikki in, in Sami and Sami Tinget in Norwegian. But this uh, Sami Dikki and Sami parliament is totally without any rights. There is no, no rights and uh, in, in uh, no political rights. So we're still missing the, the Sami rights. And the second thing they did was that they created a very weird company, which they uh, said that uh, half of this uh, company is uh, owned by the Sami people and the other half is uh, owned by the Norwegians. This uh, weird company is called uh, Finnmark's A and Domen, and uh, it uh, that uh, that's a company which, who's uh, running the the rights to hunt and uh, and to do the fishing in in lakes, and they also they also charge us for uh, for getting firewood from the forest, which. Uh, before that uh, company came, uh, was uh, free, free for us. We, but now we have to pay for it. And we also have to pay for the, for the ground uh, which, uh, which our houses are built on. So, so it's a very weird, weird company. And, and to the world, rest of the world, they are very proudly telling that, uh, look at Norway, we have solved the Sami prob 
Sami rights problem in a very peaceful way. So, so there we are right now. Um, thank you, Nilas. A, a bit of uh, information maybe for people who are watching because I was speaking about Sweden and, and uh, Nilas was now maybe speaking about Norway. So what is called Sapmi, the, the traditional homeland of the Sami people is, is today divided between four uh, nation states. So that is Norway, that is Sweden, that is Finland and uh, Russia. And it's actually difficult to give exact numbers on um, how many uh, Sami people there are before because the Nordic countries do not, any, there is no census based on ethnicity or anything of that kind and, and sort of different standards for identification are used. But the majority of the Sami people does live in, in Norway. And then the second biggest group on um, as it's often referred to in the languages here, lives on the Swedish side of Sápmi, and then um, a smaller group yet on the Finnish side, and then the smallest group on, on the, the Russian side. Um, um, I will return, of course, to the questions of the Sámi parliament and the, the so-called Finnmark Act that um, Nilas mentioned. One more question to you, Nilas, about the um, what people see as as traditional Sami culture. Very often, if they have any images at all, it's images about reindeer herding. Um, yet at the same time, many Sami, the vast majority of Sami people today, is not really involved in reindeer herding. So, how did that look uh, uh, traditionally? Can you say uh, more about that? Yeah, as you say, the reindeer herding uh, is the main traditional way of living. But we also have the fishing, fishing in the ocean and fishing in the river. And right now, the, this year, we will, nobody will uh, be allowed to fish in our big river here which is uh, called Dietno, and it's uh, one of the, used to be one of the best salmon rivers in uh, Europe. But no, it's, uh, no, it's closed for, for everyone. And there has been a big discussion of why the river is empty now. And, um, the, the Sami people, they say that, uh, well, it's because of all the tourists coming to do the fish and they have no limits uh, of how many salmon they can, they can fish. And, uh, and the Norwegian bureaucrats, they, uh, they rather blame the Sami for fishing with the nets. And the net fishing is not uh, not uh, very 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 successful for the Sami. And I I've, I've been in uh, Canada and uh, been participating with the salmon fishing in Pelacula River, and I have seen how real net fisher net fishing gives uh, real big results. That you just uh, in that time anyway. I don't know about uh, nowadays, but uh, but uh, then it was just to decide how many, how much fish you need to take, and then go fishing and get that fish. So the fishing and the and the reindeer herding is the main traditional way of living here for the Sami. Can you say something about uh, the Sami language or languages or dialects? There's a bit of a debate on whether you'd call them different languages or dialects of one and the same language. Uh, your autobiography appeared in uh, Sami, but there are uh, quite a lot of Sami people today who do not um, speak the language. Can you say a bit more about the the, the use of the language and the, the judiciary, the tradition and the history and how it uh, disappeared in parts of the Sami community? 
Well, the language situation of today is uh, much better than it was, uh, for example, uh, just uh, 10 or 20, 50 years ago. And it was in a very bad uh, condition. Nowadays, we, our kids are going to the Sami schools where the teaching language is in Sami and that, that has helped a lot. But the problem is that we are still, uh, we're still missing the Sami education books in uh, all levels. And uh, it was, it, uh, it was maybe a little bit easier if, if we only had one dialect. And uh, the Sami dialects are so different than that uh, one cannot understand and communicate with the, with all the languages through through the whole through the whole um, scale of them. The Northern Sami language is the is the biggest group, and and uh, we are also having. Uh, having language, uh, language courses on net. We have a company called eSchoola, eSchool, the electronic school, and, uh, and it has been very successful that. But uh, of course, it's also, it is a problem, but it's, uh, it's more, the, more a psychological problem now because in the worst Norwegian, Norwegianizing time, there was an active uh, politic that uh, Sami should uh, leave their the language. And uh, there was uh, lots of propaganda that uh, saying that uh, if you only speak the, the Sami language, you will not get any job and you will not survive in the modern society. And uh, nowadays, uh, anyway, here in the northern Sami districts, we are, uh, it's, uh, it's a plus to, to know the Sami language, also for getting jobs in the official offices and, and so on, like in the municipality and, and this kind of stuff. So when you mentioned the word Norwegianization, which uh, comes up quite often when people look at the, at the colonial history of Sápmi and, and similar processes of assimilation happened in uh, the other countries. One of the main features of that was a feature that you find in, in many histories of uh, colonization of indigenous people, namely boarding schools. Can you um, tell our listeners or viewers uh, a bit more about that, please? Well, the boarding school is known uh, uh, through all, yeah, everywhere in the indigenous uh, world. And it's the same history in, in Sápmiya that they, we, were, uh, we were forced to go to the boarding schools. And of course it was uh, yeah, in this uh, part of the Sápmiya, it was uh, nor, nor, the, the Norwegian language, which, which was the teaching language for the, not just the language, but everything was uh, thought for us in the school in, in Norwegian. And uh, lots of kids were, traditional kids were left behind with the school works because they didn't, uh, <clears throat> they didn't catch anything what the South Norwegian uh, teachers were, were talking about. And then uh, came a um, period when we, uh, when we learned to know a little bit of the language, but then it was lots of misunderstandings. And I'm very happy for that because uh, lots of the so-called education then in my school time was about the Christianity. And I'm very happy that they didn't uh, manage to, 
to to poison my mind with the with that because uh, I mean the the, the um, Christianity is the is the most uh, the, the sharpest tool they used for colonizing indigenous people. Something related to that I wanted to ask about because it, it ties into religion and, and since we're also talking about uh, resistance to colonial policies. If you look at the, the longer history of Sakmi, there is one event that stands out, and it also is an event that is at least sort of internationally known, mainly by the Norwegian name of the town, the Kautokaino Rebellion, uh, also because of Neil Skalp's film. Uh, can you give a little background on, on what happened there in the middle of the 19th century? Yeah, it's uh, that story is uh, touching me also personally because my my uh, my my people had to escape from Guadalajara in that time because it was a rebel against the authorities and the, and. The, and alcohol abuse. Because uh, the short story is that the, the Norwegians came with, the, with their rules and, the, and their laws. And it's, uh, this law was saying that you are not allowed to use your drum. You're not allowed to, to, to practice your own religion. And lots of people came in the became in the loose here, just uh, just waving, swaying around in the or floating around in the in in the life. And then came a Christian preacher named Lestadius, who was a very powerful, very powerful and tricky preacher that he started to preach against the alcohol abuse. And, and of course, that was, uh, that was uh, very much what, uh, what the Sami people needed then to, to get control over the, over the alcohol abuse. And uh, with this uh, story, I also have to say that uh, before this, uh, this uh, colonization and uh, the Norwegians were, came here, we had no alcohol. So people became uh, alcoholized very easily. And some people started to slaughter their reindeer herbs just to get the alcohol. And then uh, there was a group of people who started uh, protesting against this. And uh, with this alcohol, uh, alcohol sales uh, were, of course, the businessmen and also the priests. And uh, it became a, a big fight where, where some, uh, some of these uh, people were killed. And uh, then, uh, of course, this, uh, these rebels were arrested, and it was uh, among these people. The rebels were my relatives, and they got uh, they were prisoned, and one of them were also cut in the head off. His name was Mons Zombie. So that has uh, that was a very 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 important happening then uh, in, in many ways, uh, both in the negative and also the positive ways. And, uh, and for us, we, so the, the, my family were split, it, they were, we, some of them had to escape to, to this part of, of Sápmi. And this is, uh, we are now in the, 
in the east, east most eastern part of, uh, of this uh, Norwegian Sápmi. You, you did a documentary film related to the rebellion. Can you tell us more about that? Yeah, it was, I was, uh, it was not my film, but, but I was participating in that. And it was my friend, uh, Poland, the Simba, who did that film. And, and uh, we tried to, to tell the story of, of this rebels and, and focus on the head skeleton. Because we, we, in the 80s, we started to, to ask to get, uh, get back our skeletons from uh, the head, head sculpt from, from the Norwegian Museum. It was uh, in, a, in a box, paper box in Oslo, this uh, head skeleton of, of two of these guys who were, who were uh, killed. There was two guys who was uh, had had cut it then. It was uh, Monsombi and uh, the other was Ashlak Hatta. And uh, we managed to get back this uh, head skeleton, and but when we got uh, got them back to Sapmi, then there, this. Uh, Norwegian church grabbed them and, and said that oh, they have to be buried in a Christian way. And it was it was a one colony act, colonial act after this other. It was a, I felt very bad about that. And then so this history is continuing. There is still uh lot of uh, both family, families and institutions that are trying to get remains back from institutions of the, the national governments, both in uh, Norway and uh, Sweden and the other countries. Is that correct? Yeah, some people are getting back, back their head skeletons from the from these institutions, the museums and so on. But very often uh, the, the result of getting them them back is that uh, they are again uh, being buried in uh, Christian ceremonies. Well, um, I have to move to 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 my charger here. I'm yeah. running out of power here. I can say maybe something. Just real quick, a bit of information because we've been talking about the the counter kind of rebellion. So that is a a, uh, that's the Norwegian name for a, for a town in, in Sápmi, uh, also part of the, the province of Finnmark, which we will uh, return to later. So it, it was in that area and in that town where that um, rebellion took place. If we uh, stay with the history of uh, Sámi resistance, uh, also uh, tied into uh, Mila's own biography. So, so just real quick, so we talked about uh, Kaudukaino Rebellion, which is the middle of the 19th century. And then in the early 20th century, there are different um, uh, Sámi organizations being founded, uh, which provide a framework for uh, Sámi organizing. But then it was really, if we go back to, to the events of the late 1970s and the early, early 80s that Nilas already mentioned. Uh, Nilas mentioned the hunger strike in Oslo where a, uh, as it's often been called, the Sami civil rights movement emerges. But the hunger strike in Oslo, I mean, the, the movement started with protests in the far north against a hydroelectric power dam that was being built on the Alta River near a town of the same name, Alta. So can you say a bit more about that, that background of that history and, and the, the resistance movement that formed around that? Yes, it was, uh, it was an awakening of the Sami activists. And, and we thought that uh, we uh, somehow won the case because uh, somehow the Sami rights were 
were recognized uh, by by uh, Norwegian government uh, putting this uh, Sami Rights Commission to work. But uh, unfortunately, it isn't so. Uh, today, it's, uh, the situation is uh, 100 times worse than, uh, than when this uh, Alta case was going on. Now we have a, a very, very dirty and bad uh, mining company which is uh, starting to, to work. They have already got the permission to, to start uh, establishing this uh, mining company and they will uh, pollute uh, not just the land, but also the ocean. And I have heard that uh, Norway is uh, the third country which, which is allowing this uh, this uh, mining waste to be dumped in the ocean. Um, and and, uh, and uh, then we have the big uh, windmills. They are uh, planned to be built on the, every mountain top in, in the whole Sapmi, I guess. And uh, one should think that uh, the, the Sami people really hungry for electricity. And uh, we, we don't need that electricity at all. And you know, the electricity have to be uh, transported also. So they also have to make uh, very big uh, power lines, which are going through the whole holds up me and uh, and as you know when uh, when we are talking about very big power lines it occupies uh, occupies lots and lots of land it's not just the, the place where they put down the poles in the soil it's the the wave so this uh, electricity is keeping reindeers away uh, quite a distance away from, from this line. So this, uh, it's a very, very big uh, stealer of the, of the land. And so are the roads, because uh, this, uh, this big uh, windmills there, they have to be transported up to the mountain tops. And they're too heavy that the helicopter and and, uh, and so on can transport, so they have to make uh, very big roads to the mountains. So there will be lots and lots of, of roads. And uh, these roads uh, naturally will go through the reindeer grazing land and also the migrating uh, land for, for the reindeers. So lots of or reindeer herds will be just blocked away from, from their traditional areas, the, the summer grazing land and the winter grazing land. So the situation, the land rights situation is very, very, very bad now. And we have no, this Sami parliament have no power to to say no to anything. It's the Norwegian government which is uh, giving the green lights for these uh, companies. And uh, Norway is not in the need of this much electricity. The electricity is, uh, is something they will sell to Europe and, and other countries uh, where there is uh, lots of uh, not so used for electricity. And uh, the official policy here is now that the, the green shift, and I think they are really, really colorblind. It, it has nothing to do with the green. And uh, this, and uh, they're making this uh, electric vehicles like uh, cars and so on and saying that, uh, that, that uh, they are 
so good for not polluting the, the world. That, and it's just a very, very big lie, the whole thing, because uh, produce production of the, this uh, big batteries for the electrical cars is also a very big uh, disaster, not just here on our land, but elsewhere in the, in the world. I want to return to some of these issues, especially the land rights and the Islamic parliaments and, and what you described now at the end, which is sometimes referred to as uh, green colonialism. Um, but if, if I can stay with uh, Alta, the so-called Alta protests, uh, just for another second. Um, so you mentioned the hunger strike in Oslo, and that was uh, because people maybe uh, as a bit of information, so this this conflict around the, the hydroelectric dam that was built, it lasted for a few years, and it involved uh, the hunger strikes, not just one, but two. Uh, there was an occupation of the uh, prime minister's office at some point, and there was a big uh, a camp, a blockade at the site where the dam was built uh, near Alta. Um, can you tell us a bit about the atmosphere around Alta at the time at the camp and the different groups that were involved in protesting because it was not only uh, Sami people, is that right? Yeah, I always uh, send very good uh, thoughts to the young people of Oslo from that time. If it was not for them, I think uh, we would not have uh, been, been heard anything about this uh, hunger strike. And I'm not trying to avoid uh, to tell that I was blowing, I was uh, blowing up a light bomb to, in the construction area to, to get, uh, to get uh, attention to, to that. And uh, that they turned, uh, turned uh, the other way around and said that uh, that you guys are the worst terrorists. And they were uh, charging me uh, for, for, uh, for a terrorist act. And it, it, uh, they were using the, the really strongest uh, paragraph in the Norwegian, uh, Norwegian uh, paragraphs anyway. So I had to escape from from Norway and I flew to to Canada and I stayed with the with the Indian people in in Canada in two years and that saved me from being uh, rotting in the in the prison for 21 years can you can you say something more about how you were able to get from Norway at the time to Canada? Well, it started with that I had to be a very good actor in the prison. I stopped eating and uh, told the, told the, not directly, but I I made them believe that, uh, that I think they are poisoning my food, so I, don't, I cannot eat anything. And there was uh, this uh, psychiatrical doctors involved, and I had to, to be an actor, good actor with them also. And at least um, the result of that action was I was uh, without food in three weeks in, in prison and not eat, eating anything. And, uh, and uh, then came three, three weeks with uh, lunch every day in the psychiatric hospital, cantina of that. And uh, then they, uh, then they uh, somehow decided that, okay, we have to let this guy free from the from the prison until the court case comes up. But they put it uh, 
of course, a police guard watching me the, the day and night. That, uh, that so so I don't I don't escape. So I come come to this court case and and so they can give me this twenty one years in in prison in in a formal way. But I managed uh, anyway to to escape from from this uh, from this uh, system. And I uh, came to Canada, where we had uh, the Sami had. Uh, established um, a contact with the uh, late George Manuel, which was uh, the leader of the, of this um, international, international um, organization of, uh, of indigenous people. And uh, he managed then, then to, Get um, get me to this uh, leaders of the of this uh, Indian Indian leaders, uh, and they decided that then that they will adopt me in a traditional traditional way, and so they did. And uh, the Canadian. Uh, Immigra immigration authorities uh, just had to agree with this uh, Indian leaders that uh, that okay, if if this uh, Nelias just keeps a low profile, then we will uh, just let him stay there. So my uh, family then came over. They were also adopted in uh, in the same traditional way two daughters and, and the wife. And, uh, and uh, everything was, uh, was then uh, peaceful for, for a long time. But then uh, my family here in Sapmi became in a, in a bad situation that was uh, sickness and my parents were were in a very big sorrow and also, also missing us very, very much. And they were getting old. So we decided that we, we will, we will uh, move to, to Sapmi again. And in the meantime, at the same time, this, this uh, other man who was with me in this, uh, in, in, with this uh, bridge blowing action, which I was charged with, he went to. They took him to to court and uh, and just gave him a very very short time in in prison. So there was no no danger for me anymore to to return to Norway. And at the same time, there comes. Uh, television company, CTV, and ask that, uh, can we make, uh, can we make a documentary reportage about uh, you guys being adopted uh, in a traditional way and staying in, in Canada with the traditional people there in Pelakula. And, uh, we know we knew that uh, the conditions for for letting us uh, stay from the conditions from this um, of authorities immigration authorities was that uh, if you keep low profile and it's okay you can you can just stay here and uh, and when you have uh, been here in five years then you can then you can all come forward and ask for a Canadian passport. That was the, the unofficial deal with the Indian leaders. And what the, the, the need of going back to Sapmi became too big. So we said yes to, to the CTV and, and made this uh, report, reportage. No, well, knowing that uh, that uh, this is a sign, this is a signal to the 
authorities that we're not keeping low profile anymore. So, so they will uh, they will uh, arrest us and and send us home. And so they did. After this uh, reportage was made, that uh, we moved from from Bella Kula to Lake Bridge, where some of our friends were were staying. So, and uh, just after a week in in Lake Bridge, the the police came and kicked in the door where the house where we were staying arrested us and uh, I could watch the CTV documentary from the in from television in the jail and then you were sent back to Norway from there yes um And uh, the the you mentioned right. Uh, that's what I thought of when you were talking. Uh, you mentioned the World Council of Indigenous Peoples and how they were in, involved in facilitating your journey from uh, Norway uh, to Canada, and you stay there. And I wanted to just return to that for a second because I think the history of the World Council of Indigenous Peoples, which existed from I think 1975 to 96, is not that well known today, but it was a fairly widespread network at the time with peoples involved from various places around the world and conferences and obviously well-established uh, network of contacts. Uh, can you say a bit more about your experiences with the organization? Well, my experience with, organ with this organization was, uh, was that I got uh, personal uh, contacts with these people. I became to know George Manuel very well and also his uh, main secretary, who was uh, Marie Mariuli in, from uh, Lakebridge. Both of them are not uh, not longer alive, but I I send them a very very warm thoughts, and, uh, and I thank them from all my heart that they. And the, those guys were the ones who were organizing everything there for, for me. Because uh, they both had been in Sapmi and, and uh, knew the Sami situation very well. And they also knew lots of, of Sami, Sami people. And they introduced me to, to lots of very good people in in British Columbia, because, because it was uh, there, I ended. I stayed in a in a traditional longhouse for uh, for some uh, yeah, may, maybe half a year, and uh, I was uh, the best experience experience for me then was that uh, it uh, made my traditional. Uh, spirituality alive because I was so lucky to to get there just in the time when when these people were were uh, re yeah making this uh, making this uh, traditional spirituality alive again with uh, with the uh, ceremonies and prayers, uh, drum singings and, and all that. Did you see many similarities there between your own traditions and the, the traditions you found um, amongst First Nations? Yeah, I was so lucky that I was uh, where, where, where I was staying. It was uh, late Philip Paul. It's very sad to when to today when I talk about people, almost everybody are not longer alive. But Philip and I had uh, very good conversations uh, every night. 
and uh, he was asking about my my traditional religion and and I, he was telling about uh, about uh, their traditional uh, things so it was a very very good uh, education for me and i'm sure that if if it was not for that then i would have forgot everything i learned from my grandfather and uh, i was very happy that uh, that i was uh, uh, I had the chance to live together with my grandfather a whole summer in the old folks house, which was also a, a kind of a hospital. And this was, uh, this was in the 60s and Norway was uh, still uh, a very, very poor country with the health care in the hands of the missionaries. And uh, so, so that was a, that was a combination of an old folks' house and a a hospital where the doctor showed up uh, once uh, once a week. And the negative thing there was that uh, there was there came uh, always uh, lots of preachers every Sunday and uh, made it to uh, to a Christian. Uh, uh, not the church, but the place where these uh, extreme preachers are gathering. So we had a very good chance to talk with my with my grandfather, and I was uh, very curious. I became very very curious because uh, one of the, one of the hottest summer days, they came, they found a dead body in in the river. And this dead body was uh, was a late um, relative, a very close relative of my mom, and he he had been laying in this uh, river and rotting the whole winter, and and in the hot summer day they found him and they placed him right outside our of the window of, of our room. And of course, this very, very bad smell came into the whole house. And, and I was saying to my grandfather that uh, enough is enough. Now we escape from this, uh, this crazy house. And uh, my grandfather just replying that, uh, take it easy, Nilja. Say, this, is, uh, this is just the smell of a dead body. This smell we can just uh, chase away of. And he went to open the window and, and he talked something in the deep, deep, deep in his throat. I didn't hear what he said. And he waved a little bit with his hands. And, and then this uh, very bad smell just disappeared. And I was very, very, I became very curious that how did he manage to do that? And, and that was, uh, that was that led it till that I started asking grandfather about, uh, and he started telling me about the traditional, the traditional ways of, of seeing the life, the traditional religion, if you if you want. Thanks very much for for sharing the story. Um, I just as a sort of um, technical point in the discussion here, we have about 20 minutes left or a bit more. I see three questions that people have on the on the Q and A, which I will uh, get to uh, at the end. And my suggestion would be for other people who have questions to maybe write their questions if there are any more. And within the next uh, five or 10 minutes or so, and then I'll try to uh, uh, get to as many other questions, hopefully all as I can. Um, but before that, I would uh, like to return to some of the um, issues that Milos already raised with respect to the contemporary situation in uh, uh, Sami. So if we start Milos with the, the Sami parliaments that you mentioned, 
I think from an outside perspective, um, okay, so there are Sami parliaments in all of the four uh, countries uh, that uh, occupy parts of Sami. So there's one in Norway, there's one in Sweden, one in Finland, one in Russia. Um, the Sami people can vote their own representatives into those parliaments. Um, I mean, it sounds great on paper. What, what, what is the problem in practice? As I said, that there is no political power. That uh, the, the states can overrule any decisions there. So in, in many ways, they are just the service office for, 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 the, for handing out the phones and so on. And these phones, they, they, were, they were existing long before the long before the Sami parliaments uh, came, anyway, here in Norway. And uh, when we say about this, uh, when I talk about these funds, it's not just for the Sami. Everyone can uh, apply for, for money from there to fishing boats and, and so on. And, uh, and this money very much uh, makes the, the Norwegian population very jealous because, uh, because on, on the paper it, it uh, looks that uh, the Sami are getting lots and lots of money for, for, uh, for, to, for to run the Sami dig. And of course uh, it costs to run, run the Sami dig but it's a, it's a very necessary service office for the for the government. It's a, when somebody start to to build a house or, or do something in the in the nature, then there, there is a law that uh, to, that says that you have to examine this uh, this uh, ground for for. Uh, or historical, uh, what do you call this? Uh, uh, no, I, no I, my English became very, very bad. <laughs> but I am not an Englishman, so I'm happy with that. I think that's perfectly fine. I guess some kind of historical evaluation of who the land would like to belong to. Yeah, it's to, to see if there is any any tracks of, of the Stone Age people, so to say. Yeah, not, not just that, but uh, something like that. But, but speaking of land rights, so that's another thing I wanted to get back to because you mentioned what's uh, known in, in, in English as the, as the Finnmark Act, so a bit of background. So Finnmark is the northernmost, northeasternmost province uh, in Norway, which or if you picture the map, it's right at the top, uh, it borders uh, Russia and, uh, and, and Finland. And in the Finnmark Act of 2005, again, something that sounds good on paper, the, the vast majority of the land uh, of the province was handed from the Norwegian government to the people of the province who are uh, majority uh, Sami. Um, but once again, in reality, that didn't necessarily mean that, that uh, Sami people have all that much more control over the land, which seems uh, like a paradox. But uh, Milos, can you, can you uh, explain that a bit more, what happened there? It's a, it's a very tricky situation, a tricky system. That uh, it's, uh, first of all, nobody knows what this uh, Finnmark Act is about. There is, it is, uh, it's not the private company and it's not the state company. But, uh, but the one thing for sure, they are very, very greedy for money. That they collect money from 
from all, everyone who's uh, hunting and they are also dividing the, this uh, and giving up giving out this uh, hunting areas that uh, they they are the ones who decide and we have uh, there is a director and there is a board and the board is uh, the board the chairman of the board have a double vote and uh, every second year the the, the chairman of the board is uh, is the uh, Norwegian from the Norwegian uh, system, and uh, and then next time is the Sami. And uh, when the Sami is in majority, they can uh, they can uh, decide that in in some issues or everything which comes to the to the board, and they can they can use the double vote for for the German. And uh, and uh, but the, but when the when the change comes, then the, the Norwegian system can overrule the this uh, Sami decision. And uh, this happens ev almost every every time they change change place. And uh, now we have, right now we have, a, they have a discussion, this uh, Finnmark Act and, uh, and the system that uh, should they uh, give this uh, traditional uh, Sami land to, to the village of Karashoka, which is uh, almost a pure Sami village. And uh, that's also a very, very tricky thing to talk about anyway, because if they, if they give, give the, the, this uh, rights to the municipality, then uh, nobody thinks that the municipality is also a part of the, of the state system. So it's a, in a way to give it back to the state in a tricky way in the name of the Sami. And, uh, and as uh, this uh, Finnmark Act is also exactly the same, that uh, there is no difference that if it, if, if it was run by the Stadskog, which was the pure Norwegian system, or if it's this uh, FEFU, as, as we call this Finnmark Act. So it's uh, it's it's just handbook anyway. Okay. It's uh, it has nothing to do with the Sami rights. And I talked to one of the sons of George Manuel, Arthur. Late he's also dead now. He and uh, he was in a conference in in Alta, where the where this. Uh, Sami politicians who are in uh, in favor for this uh, Finnmark Act was having um, having um, yeah a conference about that to to boast that how peaceful uh, the Norwegian system have handed over the Sami rights to the to the Sami and and late Arthur he was very shocked he said that. Uh, how can that be at the, at the, you start uh, right Sami rights uh, discussion with giving away half of the whole Sami land to the op, to this uh, colonizers and then uh, continue with that uh, there is uh, three guys uh, elected from the Sami parliament and these three guys can uh, can very well be members of the of Norwegian political parties, because the Norwegian political parties are also participating in the Sami Parliament. That uh, they are uh, they are of course uh, Sami people, but they are also members of the 
of the Arbeider Party, with, which is the Labour Party, or the other, also the light, the light blue, but the, the most dark blue party, the Fremskrits Party, and, which are the extreme, extreme uh, blue wing party in, in Norway. Um, I should say maybe for international viewers, so, so view, blue blue wing parties would be uh, right party uh, right parties. Uh, so Fremskrits Partiet is often described as a, as a as a far right or right populist uh, yeah. uh, party. Um, and you know, let me get to the questions I got here from some of our viewers. Um, let me see, one actually relates to the, since you got back to the international relations. Um, so there is a question, I'll just read it for you. Uh, thanks, Nilas, so much for sending your knowledge and personal experiences. You mentioned some of your experiences with First Nations peoples and World Council of Indigenous Peoples. Has the Sami nation been making connections with other indigenous nations? indigenous nations being different than European nation states. Would the Sami people in Sápmi be considered a single nation or multiple uh, ones, multiple nations? Well, uh, not formally, but uh, we, are, we have always been, been um, stating that the Sápmi is a Sami, Sami nation. And uh, through this uh, World Council of Indigenous uh, people, we were in contact with uh, with all these uh, member member people who was uh, who was members in the in the World Council of Indigenous people. And uh, but I'm not sure that uh, because we don't have that kind of an organization anymore. So I don't know if there is any organized uh, uh, framework with the other indigenous nations, but uh, there is, uh, there is, uh, we have the Sami Council who is uh, trying to keep contact with the other indigenous uh, nations. One can add maybe, I mean, in, in terms of more informal collaboration, for example, during the, the protests um, uh, in uh, North America against the Dakota uh, pipeline, there were Sami delegations unofficially uh, traveling there and attending those. So there are some, uh, there are certainly indigenous connections, but, but uh, not on the organizational level that the World Council of Indigenous Peoples provided, uh, I suppose. Um, other questions, let me see. There is one I can answer real quickly myself because it concerns uh, the book. So the question is, is, is the, if the book is going to be available in some of the um, Scandinavian languages, uh, I, I am not sure. I, it's nothing that I, uh, have pursued. Um, the book was really mainly done for an international audience and um, just the way uh, things work uh, is that an English language book reaches uh, the, the, the biggest audience. Uh, so it's really been geared towards that, kind of assuming that people will read it who have very little background knowledge. And I never really gave it a lot of thought how this book would work in the context of the, the Nordic uh, countries. I've heard people, um, also Sami people say that it would be good if it was available in uh, languages here. I'm certainly not opposed to that, but, but there are no, as of yet, there are no concrete plans. Um, there is another question for you, Nilas, which I will read. Um, and it's, I guess it concerns questions of, of political resistance today. So the question is, um, thank you for sharing, uh, Gabriel and Nilas. I am a Norwegian citizen, 24 year old student who studies ecology and political ecology at Norwegian University of Life Sciences. 
We talk somewhat about these issues at the university, but we rarely discuss what sort of actions we can take in order to possibly turn things around. What do you see as some of the best th things an average citizen can do to stop the ongoing marginalization of the Sami people? Well, um, the, the most urgent thing now is to try to stop this, uh, this Nusir mining company from uh, polluting our fjord. And, and the second thing is this, uh, is to stop this uh, big uh, windmills. And the best thing would be to stop the, the green colonization at all, because uh, that their people are tricked to think that, that this is the the thing which is going to save the world, but it's the other way around. That it's uh, it, it is uh, the nature is uh, is very fragile, and it's uh, we we only have one of this globe, so we cannot destroy it. That's the most Im important things to to do. So again, uh, as a bit of uh, extra information, so the, the Nusir mine is a mine plan, it's a copper mine. Um, and ironically, but fittingly, everything that, that Milas uh, talked about, it is also, um, it has been announced as a, uh, a green mine, uh, ecologically friendly. There's a, a German company involved um, and I think it is supposed to be taken, uh, operation supposed to start in uh, 2024. And it is one of the uh, uh, issues that, that uh, resistance is building around now. There are other examples in Sweden right now. There are occupations uh, against uh, the clear cutting of, of forests in Sápmi. Um, but it, Nilas, maybe looking at the time, maybe the, the last question here, because I know you are fond of a new younger generation of Sami activists who don't necessarily believe that, uh, for example, the Sami parliaments or the Finnmark Act uh, will pave the way uh, for a better future. Uh, can you say something about these, uh, the, the, this generation, the activities they're involved in, and, and why you have uh, uh, hopes in, in their activities? Well, I'm very happy that we have uh, lots of, uh, of very young activists. And this, uh, these guys are very, very clever. They see everything very clear. They are not tricked like this older, uh, older generation uh, was. And uh, one thing which is very, very sad that when people are, have started to believe that something is good, that they just continue what, however bad it is, like this, uh, like this uh, Sami parliament without power and this Finnmark Act, uh, that this just uh, cosmetic things they, they made to make uh, the world believe that Nor Norway is uh, very good in indigenous politic. Unfortunately, it isn't so. And I'm very happy that this, uh, this younger generations of, uh, of Sami activists and also artists are able to, to, to tell another story. Um, thank you so much, Nilas, again, for uh, joining us and me uh, during this uh, presentation. Um, oh, here's Ash, because I wasn't exactly sure about the procedures at the end, but maybe you are going to round off here or? Sure, yeah, well, I would just love to thank you, Gabriel and Nilas for both taking time uh, to have this conversation today. 
Um, I'm sure I am not the only person in attendance today who learned something. Um, so thank you again for being here. Um, and yeah, I was just gonna let folks know again, I'll drop in, in the chat there a link to the book um, where you'll find an interview with Nilas as well as other um, in-depth interviews and um, uh, art and photographs. Um, there's lots of really great stuff in the book. Um, so if you've not had a chance to pick it up yet, please take a look at it. And yeah, thank you all again. Um, and hope you have a, a good night from here on out. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you very much. All right, y'all. Be well. Bye, everyone. Thank Bye you. now. Bye -bye.